Hey everyone! So before I even start with who I am and what this talk will be about, one of the reasons I'm here today is because Johnny Farmfield, a buddy of mine, couldn't make it. Now I bet a few of you are already familiar with him and the work that he does, but if you're serious about getting into Houdini, I strongly recommend you to check out his Vimeo. Not only does he create awesome but simple setups, he also shares all of them for free. Now his thing is that he tries to simplify a setup as much as possible, making the most of the available nodes. I however have a slightly different approach. I am more interested in what lies underneath the nodes. But let's start at the beginning. My name is David Karl and I'm a software developer and VFX artist based in Germany. My occupation however could not be further away from the world of 3D and VFX. I'm a SAP developer and consultant which might sound boring, and it is. So to entertain myself, I started to dig into visual effects. It was a long time goal of mine to do this, and my first baby steps, like many others, were fooling around in After Effects, Blender, and other softwares. That immediately started a passion for learning, creating, but also sharing. Right from the start, I also created a YouTube channel, first just as an experiment, and to document my progress but it also developed into something more. And it did not take too long for me to stumble upon Houdini, and it just clicked right away. This was the stuff I was looking for. Not only was Houdini a strong 3D package that was capable of almost everything I was interested in, it also had an entry point perfect for me and my background, its own built-in programming language called VEX. And that is the basic idea I want to talk about today. Yes, as a programmer, obviously I'm a bit biased towards it, but I want to show you why it makes sense to put VEX to the topics you want to dive right into at the beginning. But why did being a developer jumpstarted my learning progress? Houdini is split up into different context sections, geometry, dynamics, shaders and so on. Each of those has unique nodes, different workflows and there's just so much to learn. But what almost all of them have in common? they offer you to use VEX in addition to the nodes. Now before going into detail, I want to show you a simple exercise that we programmers like to do when being confronted with a new language. The so-called Hello World program. An exercise that asks how can you output these two words with that language. Most of the time that just includes a few lines that are supposed to give you a first idea of the syntax of the given language. When going into Houdini, this exercise can still be interesting if you change the question to what different ways are there to output the words. Now, the first and obvious choice in a 3D program would be to create geometry that resembles the word. And of course, there's a note for that, the font note. You simply type them into the input box and you are done. Houdini will create a result for you and it does it by using its native data points, primitives and vertices. Those will be important later on. The next option closer to the original idea would be to output to a console. For that task we can use a wrangle. A wrangle is your bread and butter when it comes to VEX driven workflows. It can run over all the mentioned data of Houdini, points, primitives, vertices, detail and since the new version also numbers. In here you have access to a big library of functions or create your own ones. One of those allow you to create the console output. That function is called printf. It is also a great tool for debugging later on. I can just write the words as a function parameter and the console pops up. Now this wrangle was set to detail. That means it gets executed for one time. If I switch to points, we get no result. And that's because we have not provided any geometry that could hold any points. So if we simply create a primitive sphere which consists of exactly one point at its center, we get our hello world message again. A wrangle has a built-in loop functionality depending on its mode and the data you feed into it. When we set the sphere to polygon and change the command to hello world with point and provide the attribute holding the current point number, you get an output for each point. An attribute would be another choice. Let's create another wrangle and this time call it specifically hello. You will see why in a few. 
Now I use the add letter and the following word gets defined as an attribute. But if I now let this run with add message equals hello world, we get an error. And that's because Houdini by default sees an attribute as a float value. But we need a string. Whenever you need an attribute to have a specific data type, you can do that by providing an identifier in front. S would be the string, so let's do that. Now, where can we now find this message? You can see it in the geometry spreadsheet. Here you can find all of the data Houdini uses to build the current scene. And as you can see, each point now has the string message of hello. And with that, I can close the circle, because the next way would be to read the attribute from outside the wrangle. You can do that almost anywhere in Houdini using expressions. Expressions are very similar to use as vex. So let's copy the first font node by alt dragging it. And here we want to read the content of the message attribute. For that we type points, then provide the name of the node we created earlier, a point number and the name of the attribute we want to read. Now as you can see that just gave us an output of what we just have written. Some areas expect to get a string like this font node and they cannot decide for themselves if this is just a simple string or a command. So to make that clear you have to capsule the statement with backticks. And now we get our message. When I change the attribute in the hello wrangle you can see that the font node will pick that up right away. And that's hello world in Houdini. Now the important lesson here was obviously not just how to output hello world. What we saw was the very basic idea of how Houdini is using its data and how its nodes can communicate with each other. You also got a small glance on where and how VEX is incorporated. Now when it comes to VEX, you will often notice that there is an ongoing discussion between Houdini users when to use it and when not. Is a VEX approach even an option in a production pipeline? I am not going to answer that question because I feel it is not my place. But I can give you my opinion on some of the arguments. Subnodes and other context nodes in general mainly have one purpose. They offer you an interface to create, organize or manipulate the data Houdini uses in its spreadsheet to get the result you are after. That is nothing else that you would do with VEX. It is just another approach. But there are definitely tasks when a VEX approach would be unnecessarily complex, while in other cases it is the other way around. But what I am talking about when I say VEX helped me to understand Houdini is not bound to the question which way was more efficient. It is bound to being able to understand what Houdini does not only in the viewport but also in the spreadsheet. When I approach a new technique I look not only at one or the other. I want to know how the subs work but also how I would recreate that with VEX. Because when it clicks and you understand how Houdini plays with the data and you have that at your disposal then you don't need to think about using subs or wrangle. You just create a solution for your problem. In that spirit I tried to come up with an example that was simple enough to go through it in the limited time I have but that would still offer some insights to the mentioned way Houdini works. In this example I want to get an animation not by a simulation but a procedural workflow that allows me to manipulate points with an object. So let's take a look at the file. To be a bit more time efficient this will be a hybrid of a scene breakdown and some life messing around in the code. As you can see we already have a fractured wall and a primitive sphere that is keyframed to fly through it. The fracture is based on points that are generated by a simple scatter node. The main work is then done within this attribute wrangle I called proximity push. Now to make it a bit more visible how this wrangle will move the points, I am going to feed the points of the scatter directly into the first input. The sphere is connected to the second input. I am also going to increase the amount of points quite a lot so you get an even better visualization of what happens. Now let's head over to the wrangle, open up the editor and take a look what's already in here. Now the first task to solve is to make the points in the wall being aware of the sphere and its proximity. For tasks like that more often than not 
I like to use a point cloud because it offers me some additional options later on. The idea is that each point in the wall tries to create a point cloud that looks for a given range and only tries to find one point. Because on the second input there is only one point to be found. Then we reach a section I call flow control. Flow control is a term out of the programming lingo. Those are structures that allow you to control the flow of your program, which sections get executed and how often. In this case I only want to execute this block and I only want to do that when the point cloud function pcNumFound returns a value higher than zero, which means the open function was successful. Then we also save the position of the sphere and with both positions, the point and the sphere, we can now determine a direction going from the sphere to the point of the wall. That's the direction we want to push the point away from the sphere. For a quick test, we also set this attribute, the color, to 1. Houdini handles color data as a vector to save the RGB values, so writing equals 1 is the same as writing 1 into each vector component. But with that, we should be able to see something happening when the sphere comes close to the wall. All of the points within the defined range execute the extra code segment and become white. And then we can activate this line of code which adds the direction on top of the position of the point. But the issue with this is that the move is instant. As soon as the sphere is in range, the point jumps to its final destination. This might be interesting if you want to create some sort of shielding effect. But here I want to get a smooth transition. So I bring in distance and fall off. First I get the distance between the point and the sphere at the current time and then change the range of that value going from zero to the variable range, which is the area where it has to be at the moment and switch that to a new range from one to zero. Now when the sphere is right on top of the point, the fall off will be one. When it's right at the maximum range, it's zero. When I now multiply the direction by the fall off, I get the result I was looking for. The points get pushed away according to the distance between their original position and the position of the sphere. Now when you build setups like that using VEX, you want to bring in more control options to make it easy to influence the outcome. And an efficient way to do that would be to bring in a random factor. Here I use the point number to create a random value that I can again refit into a different range. That range is controlled by a channel that I already created before. With the range slider I now can influence the range of the point cloud and also the effect of the fall off and with this min p slider I can create some variation for each point individually and with that changing the result of the point manipulation quite a lot. Now the interesting question now is does this work with the fractured wall right away? And the answer is yes. And it does work because of this assemble node and the fact that it creates packed primitives. Before it we had something around 9000 points. By using the packing operation each piece is represented by a single point and therefore can also be manipulated like a point. But we are left with yet another issue. Since this is not a simulation there's nothing to keep the pieces from intersecting each other and it's just a bit too obvious. I want to create a more dynamic distribution of the scatter node which in turn will change the fracture. Now instead of using SOP workflows to get what I want I take a different route. For this specific case I want to create my own scatter node, a VEX scatter. And you will see that we will find some examples of Houdini dealing with data that are just important to know and understand. The first thing to notice, the scatter node had a total count of 500. So to replicate that I set the wrangle to numbers and a count of also 500. What I basically want is that each of the iterations by the wrangle adds a new point somewhere inside of the box. For the scatter sop that meant to first create a volume to scatter into. With the wrangle we can bypass that because we have other options. But since the result of this node is supposed to deliver only points, we connect the box only to the second input while we create new points for the first one. But let's take a look at what is already in this wrangle. I know that we need to be inside of the bounding box. So I could grab the center of that box and for reference 
just add the points right away. We should get 500 points sitting in the middle of the box. But since I need to distribute them, I want to limit the possible directions by setting the Z component to zero. Then we do something similar to the proximity push. We want to create a direction which we use to push the points only this time without a source and without any falloff. I've prepared a statement that creates a random value for each component based on the element number, which is the current iteration of the wrangle, and a seed. Let's see if that's enough by now adding that direction on top of the point position. And that looks a bit weird, doesn't it? So what happened? The cause for this is the way Houdini's random functions work. When they get the exact same input, they will always create the same output. Which means whenever the x component has a value of maybe 0.6, that will be the same for the y and z component. One way to solve this would be to simply add another number into the mix. By simply adding one more to the input, all components will create an independent result. With that, we again reach a flow control section, where I deal with another quality of random functions. They always create a value between 0 to 1. And that's why you see the points only appear in the shape of a box going from 0 to 1 in each axis, with the origin point at 0. Again, there are more efficient ways, but this helps to illustrate how vectors behave quite nicely. Again, we use a RAND function, but this time we want to get four different reactions out of it. So I check if the value is below or equals 0.25. And in that case, I invert the x-axis. I then continue to check one fourth of the possible number range to negate the vector components of the direction which will cover all possible directions in the end. Now going the detour of creating VEX for something this more or less complex task, you want to build control options into it. And since you can manipulate values however you want, you will find that you can create results that the basic SOP can't do on its own. Again, by adding random values that can be changed according to the external channels, that gives you a lot of control over the outcome. The basis for a lot of interesting effects. But back to the task at hand. We still have to solve one issue. Our points still only move from 0 to 1 on the z-axis, which is a problem when the thickness of the wall changes. One way to solve this would be another useful function, the intersect. It sends a test ray from the source point along a direction and if it hits anything, we get the primitive number that was hit and the position where the hit occurred. To check if that really works, we can create some additional points at the hit position. And that seems to work fine. Now the only thing we have to do is getting the distance between the center and the position of the hit. Then we use normalization in reverse. We take the 0 to 1 value and stretch it along 0 and the distance we got. We should do that for all the axes, but we don't need that in this scenario. Now we scatter the points along the whole Z component. But the very key to the effect I was after in the first place is that we can create channels for every value we want to. So I can go even to the last line where I add the direction to my position and add a new offset vector on top of it. This gives us full control of the position and the scattered points as a unity. And that also reflects in the fracture. That also means we can now bind the UI element to a value like our keyframe sphere. So I just copy the Z component and paste that reference to our sphere. That puts the fracture into a constant change depending on the proximity of the sphere creating very small shards when the sphere is in the wall 
but after it goes through, the pieces grow and get back into place. The overall animation is now a lot smoother and does a way better job of hiding the intersections. Now I hope this had some creative sparks in it for you. But I bet something else got pretty obvious. You don't want to write a code like this again and again when you want to reuse a functionality. And neither do I. So I wanted to create a function library of my own. And you basically have three different choices here. You could create a file containing all the VEX functions you created and include them at the beginning of your wrangle. You can even save that as your default. And all your wrangles will have that include right from the start. Another way would be to use the HDK and create a plugin. This would allow you to use the functions like any other. The third option, which was my choice, would be to create a digital asset. This way you are not limited to only VEX functions, but also practical SOP setups that you use again and again. Not only can you easily keep developing in within Houdini, you can also easily share it with other people. So I started to develop an asset containing functions and operations I found interesting and which I might use again later on. The idea is that you can bring up a node like any other and have a simple interface to choose one or more operations to apply. For example, if I want to push the current geometry into positive space or to normalize its size, I can now do that with a simple toggle. The VEX scatter wrangle you just saw is now also included, but with a simple change to it. Instead of using the center and putting it to zero on one component, I chose to use the min component of the bounding box to begin with. Now, one argument of the mentioned discussion between SOPs versus VEX is that a network of SOP nodes can provide you with interesting results when you bypass a critical node. You can get the same results with VEX. Here you just interchange a function or change the channel input you created. As you can see, I can now activate the VEX scatter with a simple click, but the distance control now create a very interesting effect by simply manipulate the range of the fit function. Now, as I mentioned right at the beginning of this talk, I created a YouTube channel that develops into something more. When I started to learn Houdini, that also found its place on the channel. And over time, I got better in sharing what I gathered. I became good enough so that I got the chance to create a plus side course. And that brought me to execute on an idea that was growing inside me. I wanted to provide a way for others to make use of VEX even if they have never written a single line of code. So I created the course VEX Fundamentals. That course was just recently published a few weeks ago. It is split into two parts. The first part does what I was talking about. Explain what VEX is and how you can use it, expecting no previous experience from you. The second part is meant for those that want to see how it gets utilized in a more complex project. I created a procedural coder generator that in the setting of a, being a VEX course tries to emphasize VEX as the main tool for problem solving. The result of that course chapter, its functionality and some of the more interesting solution it created, I want to showcase now. Here you can see what you will end up when finishing the course. So let's take a look. First we can switch to a path camera and then take a flight through our coder network. The path for the camera is randomly generated by some VEX logic. Let me show you some of the steps that were involved to create the setup. We have some of the overall controls right here in a control node, but the very first key element is inside the create corridor network. This is the basis for the general corridor body. Here you also have some additional controls to manipulate the result. The main operator for that is the direction seat, which controls in which direction the coder continues. 
The results you can see in the viewport are done in two iterations. If you wanted to, it would be very easy to increase that. When you are satisfied with the basic body of the corridor, we will do some VDB conversion and prepare the mesh for further processing. We use attributes to find the walls, ceilings and floors. When that is done, we need to separate our geometry into the major pieces. During that process, we also create additional attributes to guide the design networks. The output of this node is reduced to the bare minimum which is needed to continue. But inside of this subnetwork, we created a lot of guiding geometry that we can use at any point using object merge nodes. Next, we use techniques like the cross product to find points and orientation to place gates. These gates also can be controlled by operators to be open or closed. This module will also teach ideas how to make use of IDs to directly control which elements in your scene should be influenced. In the next area, we look at gateways and transform them from a simple box to a more complex shape. That process is divided into multiple sections like the floor, the walls and the ceiling and also the set dressing. So to create an example for that, we create an independent operation for each gateway, find specific points to place additional geometry and also create operators to create a random chance for that geometry to appear. But obviously most of the heavy lifting was done in the creation of the coder design. To create a stable system that is able to do all the necessary decision making to make sure each corridor is designed properly and has all the geometry at the right place, VEX was an essential tool to do that. So let's take a look at the options you'll have. Right from the start, to visualize that each corridor site uses its individual logic, we get a random color for each connected area. During the course, we will build six different and individual designs using different approaches. Which of those designs are used is also controllable by operators. Select one specific design or change the interval of available design choices. In addition to that, we have a seed that randomly changes the design picked per corridor. Now the course is not meant to create amazing detail but to give you tools that will enable you to create those details. And essential for that is to have total control which design is used, be it one design for the whole corridor or have one base color per corridor. You also want to be able to make choices that affect the whole network. Here using color as an example. I guess that's enough for an overview. Let's take a look at the more interesting problems that needed to be solved. Now if we go back to the beginning of this network, we will find that it all started with one single box. And somehow we need to start. We have four possible directions and to make it easy to visualize this in your head, I made use of the idea of a compass that is pointing north, east, south and west. Each gateway now has attributes to reflect that. It allows me to control which entrance is open. That's when I place the first set of corridors. Each corridor ends with another gateway, which in turn, during the next iteration, will also create new corridors and again close with another gateway. This can be repeated as often as you want. The procedural approach behind this also allows you to reuse most of the nodes you created. But after repeating this step for multiple times, you will run into the need to create some control checks. Going forward, you need to make sure that you create clean geometry without any intersections. And to ensure that, we're going to create some VEX logic that makes sure the corridor is only as long as space is available and if there's no space, the entrance won't open in the first place. Another problem that needed to be solved was to identify one side of the corridor or if needed, one corridor as a whole. To do that, I created a corridor ID and a shared corridor ID. That ID will drive the design and color selection. In this specific case, I needed an attribute transfer to distribute that ID. 
but due to the range mechanism of that node, it was not an option for this corridor setup. So I needed to create my own attribute transfer with VEX. And that was basically my goal during this course. Demystify VEX so that you can use it as one additional tool when working in Houdini. But after everything was set up, I was faced with yet another challenge. Yes, I was able to create a lot of geometry with quite a lot of details. But in the end, you also want to render that. And one crucial factor for rendering are the lights. I have placed quite a lot of lights in this setup. But turning all of the light geometry into actual lights is just not an option. So you definitely have to make use of instancing. But even if you instance all your lights in a complex project like this, you will still hit your limitations. So the idea was to not just create a light instance for every light geometry. Instead, I wanted to create a position and that position controls which instances are active. And that was one of the reasons to create a camera path. Because I can use the position of the camera to control the lights I want to be relevant at the given time. And that meant I needed to create an algorithm that was able to find a path through the coder network following a few simple rules. The result of that algorithm creates a randomized path choosing a random direction at each gateway. But having that camera position now allows me to minimize the used lights to what is relevant for the current scene in regard to what the camera sees at that very moment. So if you're interested in an introduction to VEX as well as its application in a complex project, I invite you to take a look at VEX fundamentals on Plural side. My name is David Karl and thank you for listening.